Okay, so uh, just a little introduction because I've got a lot to get through and I don't want to spend uh, very much time on myself. My name is Michael Jackson. I, uh, I'm still alive. I, uh, uh, yeah, everybody's telling me, like, dude, I thought you died. So um, I am originally from California, uh, but I live here now in Utah. Um, I work as an independent uh, Ruby contractor, web developer. I do a lot of uh, web development work, just uh, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, whatever. Uh, today, I want to talk uh, about a library called Rack. Now, I've only been really using Ruby for about, um, about two years. And uh, that's kind of the same time, not really, but it's kind of the same time that Rack came on the scene and people were like, whoa. And I was like, whoa, because I, I came from a PHP background. And uh, roll your eyes now, OK? And uh, yeah, seriously. And uh, I was like, whoa, what is this Rack? And, and we, what was crazy was everybody uh, started like putting their libraries on Rack. You know, like the Rails guys were like, hey, we should use Rack. And, and the Sinatra guys were like, we're using Rack, and, and the Thin developer was like, I'm Thin is Rack, and I was like, what the heck is Rack? Uh, and, you know, I, I, uh, I was actually talking to a developer uh, friend of mine uh, last year, and he was, he was uh, developing an app in Rails, and he's like, oh, Rails 2.3 is on Rack. And he was like, now I gotta learn Rack, and as well as Rails, you know? And I was like, you don't have to learn Rack, like, it, it all just works for you, you know? But, but I think his comment kind of typified, um, unfortunately, uh, the feeling that I, I've heard from a few other people too, like, what is this rack thing, you know? What is this library? Like, a lot of people are talking about it, but what does it do? Why is it necessary? You know, what, 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 are, we, what are we using it for? Um, and so the, my talk today, um, the, the, the reason that I think it's important is because it has seriously... Uh, changed the way that that we write for the web in Ruby. Let me see just by a show of hands real quick. I promise this is the only time I'll make you raise your hand. How many people are using Ruby to do web? Web servers, web frameworks, web uh, services. That's like everybody in here, okay? There are like five people not raising their hands. Everybody is using Ruby to do web. Uh, what's so cool about the Ruby web development community, and you realize this if you come from another background, is that you can write uh, stuff in Ruby, like you can, just, you can just take all of these different servers and frameworks and libraries and middlewares, and you can like stick them all together, you know, like in some big hodgepodge. And it's, it's, it's kind of weird because, it, you know, in other languages, if, if you're a PHP developer, for example, okay, what are you going to do if you're going to write a web app? You're going to be like, okay, uh, we're going to use Drupal, or we're going to use, I don't even know, what are the PHP? Cake or something, yeah. And, and so it's like, we will use the framework. Do not go outside the framework, you know? And we are running it on Apache on mod PHP. That's it. And, and you know, some dude's like, hey, let's run it on, you know, fast CGI. No. Because, I don't know, it might be different on fast CGI, you know? We might have some different environment variables. So you just, you know, we're running it on mod PHP, we're running it on Apache. And it's like, it's, it's this very strict sort of, uh, you know, uh, way to develop and deploy your apps. And then you come to the, to the Ruby world and it's like, hey, you know, what do you want to write your app in? I don't know, we could write it in Rails, we could write it in Sinatra, we could write it in Merb. Well, not anymore, because Merb got the axe, but, well, I don't know. Did he get the axe? I don't know. Still alive? I don't know. Anyway, uh, and then, well, how are we going to deploy it? Well, I don't know. We could, like, do it on Mongrel, or we could run it on Passenger, or we could run it on Thin. Now you all know how many characters my password has. Okay, so basically... I'm going to take this down. Is that okay? Because I want to be... Oh, snap, there is. I'm kind of a wired guy, but I'll try this wireless thing. Hello? Hello? Oh, yeah, it's good. I'm live. Nice. Uh, so anyway, this is what I'm saying. We've got lots of ways to write web apps, right? We can write them however we want. We've got lots of ways to serve web apps. 
Um, does that ever strike you as kind of like, wow, how do, they, how do they all work together, you know? I mean, how, how is it possible that I can take a Rails app and I can deploy it on any number of application servers, but I can, I can take a Sinatra app and I can run it on all those servers as well? Like, I can basically write it for any framework and run it on any server that I want. Um, it's, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, here's, here's kind of like how I, how I picture it, right? Along the top here, you've got all your different ways to serve web apps, right? You've got CGI or FCGI, uh, and then you've got uh, things like, uh, you know, Passenger, which is, you know, an Nginx or Apache module, and then you've got your different app servers, which are uh, pretty popular, and ob obviously this is not a comprehensive list, right? There are lots more. Along the bottom, you've got all your different frameworks, right? These are all the different ways you can write an app in Rails or Sinatra or Camping or Merv or Ramazi, Ramaze. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. So in, uh, back in the early days, uh, the people who were writing Rails were like, okay, how are we going to run a Rails app? I don't know, let's run over CGI, okay. So if you were writing a Rails app like before 2.3, you had a little file in your public directory called dispatch.cgi. Anybody familiar? Oh, sorry, I told you I wouldn't raise your hands. No, put them down. <laughs> and then there was another file called dispatch.fcgi, right? Um, and then, so if, and then Mongrel came along and it was like, okay, uh, so there's a Mongrel command and then there's a Mongrel underscore Rails command, right? So you see the coupling that was happening? You have, you have a, a specific adapter for Rails uh, and all these, and, 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 uh, and you know, uh, 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 an adapter for Rails and CGI, an adapter for Rails and FCGI, uh, uh, a, a specific layer of software for Rails on Mongrel. Uh, Finn had, ha has a Rails adapter, you know, so it, it can detect if it's being run from inside a Rails directory. So you've got these couplings that are going on. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of represented by these arrows. Any, anytime you want to run Rails on any one of these different servers, you've got, you've got a little coupling there. It might be small, right? It's a small thing, but there is still a little bit of coupling going on. Uh, so if you, you kind of do the math, you follow the pattern, you've got, you know, anytime you want to write a web app, anytime you want to you write a framework, uh, if you want to run it on all the different servers, you have to figure out how you're going to run it on all those different servers, right? This is stuff that... Like, you don't, you don't ever think about if you code PHP because it's just like, yeah, we're going to run on Apache and mod PHP. Like, duh. Why would we do anything else, right? But it, it, it changes when you've got a language like Ruby and, uh, and it, 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 it wasn't, like, written for the web, you know? Just people are using it for the web, right? So, uh, so it's a mess. Uh, you need the, 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 the common kind of language here, and that's Rack. Okay, Rack is basically, it's a, it's a library that has a, a, an interface, it specifies an interface for servers and frameworks, right? So this, is, this says, this is how you talk to one another, okay? So you don't have to worry about Rails, you don't have to worry about what app server you're running on anymore. You are a Rack app, and the same for you, Sinatra, and the same for you, all you frameworks. You are Rack apps, and then you can run on any framework you want, right? And then I can write some middleware, and I can be like, yeah, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I, I just wrote some really cool middleware. Well, cool, how am I going to use it? Well, you can use it with any, anything that's Rack compatible. Right, so I can, have a, I can have a piece of middleware, and I, I'm writing a Rails app, and I'm like, that's a really cool middleware. And we'll get into middleware. Don't worry about it if this is going over your head. We'll, we'll talk about what is middleware, right? So, it, it, you know, everybody talks to Rack, and Rack handles the translation. Um, that's a pretty huge thing. Well, how do they, how do they know? There's a spec. <sighs> Duh. It's like a spec. Oh, my gosh. Revolutionary. It takes you like five minutes to read this spec. It is so small. Uh, if you are developing for the web, hello? If you're developing for the web, uh, you need to go read the spec. Do yourself a favor. Go read the spec. Uh, because no matter how you're writing stuff for the web, you are using Rack nowadays. Unless you're just like straight up writing XML files, pumping them through Rake, and like sprinkling XSLT on them and making a little website. Like, if you have anything that's any application logic on the server, you're running on Rack. Um, so follow the spec. Uh, let's let's talk about it. What is the spec? This is the spec in a nutshell. Okay. 
You've got, uh, it basically specifies three things. You've got an environment. What is an environment? It's a hash. What, are the, what does a hash have? It has keys and values. The keys are like HTTP, uh, CGI-like headers, right? So like, I don't know, HTTP host, uh, you know, path info, query string, you know, these types of things that you get uh, in, the, in your CGI environment. And then you've got uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of variables in that environment that Rack throws in there as well. It's all in the spec. Like I said, it's real simple, real straightforward. Uh, you've got apps, okay? An app, what is it? It's an object responds to one method. I mean, you can't get any simpler. Responds to one method, call. Takes one parameter, the aforementioned hash, right? What does it return? It returns an array. Three elements in the array. Status, headers, body. The genius about Rack is that it is so simple to implement. It's not like, you know, uh, it's not like some book, you know? I mean, everybody's like, yeah, we could do that. That's easy. Like, we could totally be Rack compatible, you know? And, and, and you'll see it, actually. Uh, we're going to look at, like, some of the Rails source code later. Um, you've got, like, like in, in Rails 3, which, by the way, I know uh, some of the authors are here, and they've done a uh, fantastic job with it. Uh, you, you, you go and you check it out, and it's, it's all just like, it's all middleware. Like, uh, because it's, it, all you need to have is a method in there that takes a hash, you know? Uh, I might not be making sense, but this is, kind of a, this is kind of an example of what that hash looks like. Okay, this is kind of what your environment looks like, okay? If you have developed in, in other environments and you're coming to Ruby, you will realize the significance of this hash. <laughs> it's... Uh, it's awesome that you can always count on those values being there and being written in the same way no matter what environment you're running in, okay? This is your environment hash. Uh, this, is, this, this is like an app that's like, a, a, like super simple. So the top, right? A lambda. Um, it's got a call method, right? So a, a lambda is a valid rack app. Uh, you could run, the, you could fire up this Rack app, and we're going to. I'm going to show you how we kind of run it. Uh, you could fire that thing up, and you could, you could just serve hello world all day. People would love you. Um, or, you know, you could instantiate a little object here, right? We've got a little class. It's got a little method called call. Boom, we instantiate it, and all of a sudden, it's a valid Rack app, right? Uh, these are just kind of, you know, real simple examples. I keep talking about middleware. What is middleware? Middleware really is the lifeblood of the Rack ecosystem. Go to GitHub, search for Rack. You'll get like, I think it's, I think it's up to almost 500 repositories, okay? You know, uh, the, 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 the manual stuff that you kind of have to do like every time you write a web app, you know, like how are we going to do sessions? You know, how are we going to do cookies? How are we going to do, I don't know, JSON to the client? How are we going to do... Detect if it's a, a, a mobile client. Like, like monotonous stuff. It's, it's all just middleware. And I'm going I'm to show you how it works. So middleware is like a, fancy, it's like a fancy app. It's got one more method, right? It's got an initialized method. When, uh, when middleware is invoked, it's inserted into the pipeline. I'll show you how that happens. It takes an instance of the app in its initialized method. Okay, so this is kind of a generic template for a middleware. Stores the instance of the app, right, internally. And then later on, when you call it, all it's got to do is it's got to say, app, I'm calling you. So it just, it just passes the environment right through, right? So you can have a chain. You could, they, they, like, wrap one another, right? So it's like your app is at the core, and then you've got all these middlewares that are just wrapping it, right? And when one of them gets called, the, the, uh, they just pass the environment all the way down to your app that's at the very core, of the all right, and then it uh, it will return the array right, just like the spec says. Status headers body returns the array, and it returns it to the the wrapper that called it, which does something useful we presume with the status headers and body, and then returns that to, to the wrapper that called it, and it returns it and, re, and and it just passes it right back up the chain right. Uh, it kind of looks like this, right? So if I so if I'm using these middlewares. I've got this app that I'm running, okay? This app is the smart part, right? This is my logic. And then I've got these middlewares that do things for me, right? I don't always want to have to specify. I, like, 
For example, uh, okay, so the first one, common logger. You know, uh, if you're running like a, a PHP app on Apache, for example, you've got Apache that's writing out these log files, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, Nginx will do the same thing, um, but sometimes you want to like, get a log of just the stuff that actually hits your app and not like, you know, all the requests for static files and stuff like that. You want to get, you want to see just the requests that are hitting your app. So you insert common logger into the pipeline. What does it do? As the request comes in, it hits common logger, uh, and common logger actually doesn't do anything with it until, until the response comes back out. Okay? So then common logger, what does it do? It takes a look at the status. It takes a look at like, the, you know, the time, uh, the, you know, the, the user agent that was used. You know, it, and it makes like an Apache style log, right? Uh, same thing with like, these other middlewares. Like, um, I'm going to talk about rack lock, for example. Like, it, is, it is super simple. You've got a, a, an environment variable called rack.multithreaded. Ed, or multi-thread, I can't remember. Anyway, all it does is uh, it, 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 it's got a mutex, right? And it says, uh, uh, you know, maybe my app is not safe for a multi-threaded environment, okay? So, like, have you ever thought about that? Well, if my, if my app isn't safe for a multi-threaded environment, like, I have, I have to figure out some single point of execution, right, where I can say, stop the world, you run, Right? And then you run, and then you run, and then you run, right? So that a mutex is, or a lock is, is perfect for that because I can just synchronize calls to my app and I can say, okay, you know, it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Um, I, I'm not sure about um, the, uh, the uh, like, last, last thing I knew, I, like, the Rails library was thread safe, but I, I booted up Rails 3, and anyway, Rails 3 was using rack lock. Somebody else could probably address that uh, better than I can. So anyway, they, then there's like these content type, content length, middlewares. Um, basically, what are these doing? So it, the rack spec says when your request comes back out, when your response comes back out, it better have a content type and it better have a content length, right? That's just HTTP uh, uh, spec stuff. And so you say, okay, uh, if I'm too lazy to put that in, why don't you automatically determine it for me? And so it'll say, okay, if you don't have a rack, let's take a look at the code. Like, it is so simple. Here's rack content type, right? It's doing exactly what I told you. On the way in, boom, it stores your app. It also, this one also takes a default content type in case you forget to specify a content type in your HTTP headers, right? Gets called. Uh, so it immediately, what does it do? It just calls your app. Calls whatever app it's wrapping, okay? That could be another piece of middleware. That could be an app. The thing is, it doesn't care. That's the beauty, right? It's decoupled, right? It doesn't care. All it knows is whatever I'm wrapping, whatever that app is, the rack spec said it has a method called call, and it takes one parameter, and that's the environment. So I'm just going to call it. I'm going to pass it. I know what I'm going to get back, status, headers, body. I get it back, uh, and in this case, all I say is, if there's not a content type already in the headers, set one, and then pass it back up the chain. Right? So you see a lot of middlewares that are very um, simple like this, and then we're going to see a lot that are a lot more complex, too, that are like, wow, I didn't realize... You could do that much, you know, with just, a, with just a, 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 an array of status, headers, and body. But you can do some amazing things. Uh, how are we going to run this thing? It's easy to run a Rack app, okay? Uh, this, is, this is like the, the verbose way to write it, okay? So if, if you want to run this app, take this code, stick it in a file called myapp.rb, whatever you want, and just invoke it with the Ruby interpreter. What's it going to do? Requires the Rack library sets up an instance of Rack Builder. Rack Builder just takes that chunk that's in the middle right there, right? And it just evals it, instance evals it, right? So Rack Builder has three methods, use, map, and run. And uh, it just takes, it just takes, uh, it takes, and it, and it returns an app when you call this to app method, right? It actually creates an instance of a Rack URL map if you want to kind of dig down deeper. Uh, and it's just, it's a real simple way to build an app, right? Then you say, call my handler. In this case, I'm using Webrick, right? But the beautiful thing is, is Rack has already, it's already abstracted that out for us. Like, we don't have to figure out how to pass this app to Webrick or to Finn or to Mongrel or to Passenger or to whoever because that's what Rack does for us, right? We say, run my app. Run it on port 9292. 
You can stick a host in there if you want. Um, rack ships with a tool called rack up. Okay, what is rack up? Rack up is just basically, uh, it's just basically what I told you. It's like it 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 it, ta- it it creates an instance of the builder, and takes the code in your config.ru file, slurps it up, sticks it inside a builder, and off you go. Right. So it's just a little bit more terse. Right. So notice this. Uh, when I go to this, all I did was, you know, just, move, just remove some of the verbosity, right? So this, I would stick it in a file called config.ru, run it with rackup. Um, you, you, rackup-h will give you an option of, uh, or give you, give, you, give you some options that you can use with rackup. You can uh, run it in a different environment, run it on a different port, etc. cetera. Uh, use a different server. I think it defaults to, uh, I think it defaults to Webrick, yeah, because obviously that's the one that ships with Ruby, right? Uh, there's a cool little library called Shotgun, right? So what happens when you, when you fire up your app and it's running and it's in memory, um, right? You tweak it, right? Because something's broken or whatever, you're developing. You tweak it, and then it's like, crap, I got I to gotta go back to my console, right? I got to kill the process. I got to fire it up again. And then I got to refresh, right? It's kind of a pain. Ryan Tomeko, uh, he's uh, one of the GitHub guys now. He uh, wrote, a, wrote a nice little library called Shotgun, uh, basically, what it does is it um, it loads your app in a separate process every single time. Um, so you you uh, uh, so like every time every time your app gets hit, every time it's requested, it loads in a separate process. So you don't have like your old application code. You understand what I'm saying? Nod your head like this if you're still okay. All right, five people I think following. Okay. okay. The rest are just too lazy to nod. I know you guys are smarter than that. Okay. Routing. How do you, how do you, so it's like I said, so, right, so you can mount all kinds of different apps at all kinds of different places, right? I can mount an app on the root, right? So when somebody requests the root of my website, some app runs. And then when somebody requests slash downloads or whatever, a different app runs, right? A file server maybe. And then when somebody requests, you know, my, my, my different post uh, URLs or something, uh, different app runs. How do we route? Um, Sinatra DSL uh, is kind of the one that's often imitated, never equaled. People are always trying to imitate the Sinatra DSL. <laughs> if you haven't written a library that imitates the Sinatra DSL, you're behind. You, know. <laughs> you need to get on it because like yours could be so much cooler than Sinatra. Okay, uh, rack mount. Um, like I said, I'm going to upload a lot of this stuff to, um, these are just some basic examples of, you know, here's what you do, it, how, here's how you run a Sinatra app, here's how you use the rack mount library. Uh, I'm going to upload this, so I, I want you guys to download it. I just have a few minutes left, um, so I'm just trying to run, rush through the, the end here. All kinds of debugging libraries. Um, take note of these, rack lint and rack show exceptions. You've got a rack shell. So imagine you're, you're running your app, boom, you crack open a shell, and you're, you're like in your app. So you can make requests and you can do all kinds of stuff right, right from the shell. You can see the responses coming back from your server. I mean, it's awesome. Um, let's see, rack bug. Check that out if you do Rails. Make mental note of rack bug. It is awesome. Uh, I forget the name of the guy. Brian, Brian Helmkamp, is it? That, that's right, Brian Helmkamp did that. Awesome library. Uh, rack debug, not ready for 1.9 yet. I'm going to skip. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, middleware. Um, there's lots of middleware out there. Please, whenever you think, like, oh, I'm going to write something to do this, like, don't do it. I promise you, somebody already wrote it. Head over to GitHub, check it out. Uh, check out Rack Contrib. Check out, um, check out the Rack library. There, there are a couple useful middlewares in the Rack library. You can do streaming uh, chunked HTTP responses. You can do uh, e-tag headers, like, automatically. You can do, um, you know, sessions and cookie handling. I mean, you get all this stuff with Rack. You get all of it. Um, I actually have, there's a sample app that I've got in the repository. So when you, when you uh, go and you download the code from the repository, there's a little app there. Just run it with the Ruby interpreter. It's, it's, a, it's a Twitter cache limiter app. So basically, it's just a very simple Rack app. It just makes sure that you don't hit the, uh, hit the Twitter API more than it likes to be hit. Right? That's all it does. 
But it's a, it's a kind of a cool example of a raw rack app. It's complete with unit tests, uh, so you can run the tests and everything. So this is an app that you can just download. You can say, what is all this rack stuff about? It's very simple. I think it's like 100 and something lines of code. And you can check it out, and you can run it, and you can say, OK, I get rack now. Um, since I'm done, uh, I just want to know, you know are, there any, are there any questions anybody has about rack? Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you go about actually specifying parameters to pass to a rack app? Right. So if uh, so, you're talking. Okay. So if I'm gonna so if I'm gonna use the use method, do you know what I'm talking about in the uh, the in the rack builder DSL? Remember, I showed that app. It's got the rack builder, and you can call three methods inside: use, map, and run. Uh, when I say use this class, right? Use rack content length or in this case, content type was the one that we showed. I can say use rack content length, comma, and then whatever I pass after that, right, I can pass it a list of arguments that all just get passed to the constructor uh, when it gets initialized. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? What about asynchronous request activity in this case? Um, so, <laughs> I'm, Um, you know, honestly, I, I, somebody have an answer for that? I, honestly, I would, I would either fork a separate process or use something like, you know, there are libraries specifically for that, like delayed job and... Right on. Yeah, dude, right on. It's all been done. You don't have to do anything. You just gotta. Oh, thanks, dude. Thanks for your lib. Okay, um, let me get. Let me uh, just kind of let you know. Uh, here's where you can download the code. Here's where you can find me. It's a pretty lame blog, but I don't know. Go there if you don't have anything to read. I'm on Twitter. Thank you very much.